jilted lovers, clinically insane, or just caught up in the heat of the moment. Female offenders might be rare in the grotesque world of serial killers, but their crimes aren't any less gruesome than their male counterparts. We're looking into seven female murderers who went down in history. Who'd they kill? How did they kill? And most importantly, what made them kill? Stay tuned to find out. Jolly Jane. Jane Toppin was an American nurse who confessed to killing 31 of her patients and their family members between 1895 and 1901. Toppin had earned the nickname Jolly Jane during her career because of how cheerful she seemed. She experimented on her favorite patients at Cambridge Hospital to test the effects morphine and atropine would have on their nervous systems. Described as both brilliant and terrible, Jane had always stood out. Maybe not murderously odd, but definitely strange. After having killed five members of the same family, her murderous spree finally came to an end in 1902, and Jolly Jane was convicted of killing 12 victims, one of them being her own foster sister. So what drove this cheerful nurse towards insanity? Some claim that she did it out of jealousy. Others argue it was to evoke sympathy, but Toppin herself said that she felt a thrill from seeing her victims grasp for life, knowing they were going to die. Jane insisted on being tried as sane, but the state ordered her to be committed for life at Taunton Insane Hospital, where she eventually died in 1938 at the ripe old age of 84. Giggling Granny Nanny Doss is often referred to as the Giggling Granny, which in hindsight is a terrifying visual in itself. Doss was convicted of killing 11 victims, four of whom were men she had married. As a child, Doss would often enjoy going through her mother's romance novels and the Lonely Hearts section in magazines. Her father, however, wasn't so forthcoming in her fascination and instructed Doss and her sisters to never dress up, wear makeup, or talk to boys. While Doss fantasized about living blissfully with a partner, none of her five marriages were pleasant. Her husbands ranged from alcoholics to adulterers and holier-than-thou ministers who objected to Doss's fascination with romance novels. Doss was apprehended in 1954 after her fifth husband died under mysterious circumstances, shortly after receiving a clean bill of health from his doctor. Nanny Doss was convicted of killing a total of 11 victims, four of her husbands, a mother-in-law, her sister, two of her grandchildren, and her own mother. Her M.O. Poison. Doss confessed to poisoning her victims after taking out life insurance policies on them. For example, she killed her two-year-old grandson Robert in 1945 after taking out a $500 insurance policy on him. Nanny Doss confessed to all 11 murders but was only convicted of killing her fifth husband. She died from leukemia while being incarcerated at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in 1965 at the age of 59. The Redding Baby Farmer Had Amelia Dyer been convicted of the 400 murders she had confessed to instead of the six that were proven, Dyer would have gone down as the most prolific serial killer in history. Amelia Dyer was a British serial killer who made her money through baby farming. Parents would hand over care, but not custody for a monthly fee, basically a non-state mandated foster system. To the public, Dyer appeared as a mild-mannered elderly woman. This worked to her benefit each time she visited with families who were looking to hand over care of their infants. She'd advertise her services in the newspaper under an alias or respond to their advertisements. Once the babies were in her care and she'd received money from the families, Dyer would murder the children, usually by strangulation. Could Dyer have been caught earlier on in her spree? Yes, and pretty easily, actually. Amelia Dyer grew sloppy after the first couple of murders. She'd basically ask for a one-time fee for caring for an infant, take them home, strangle them, and skip town. Dyer was eventually tried and sentenced to be hanged in 1896. At the time of her death, Amelia Dyer filled in five books worth of her murders, methods, and reasons. Mayuki Ishikawa The Kotobuki Sanin incident was one of the arguments made towards legalizing abortion in Japan. The incident refers to over 84 possible cases of infanticide between 1946 and 1948. Mayuki Ishikawa, her husband Takeshi Ishikawa, and Dr. Shiro Nakayama were arrested by the police after finding the remains of five infants in 1948. Ishikawa was tried as the key perpetrator for the crime because it was at her maternity home 
Katabuki Sanin that police discovered the incarcerated remains of an approximate 84 infants. Ishikawa was a trained midwife who had taken unwanted infants against a set fee. While she might have actively found good homes for some children initially, Ishikawa eventually got bored of the hassle and neglected the infants in her care, all of whom inevitably starved to death. Dr. Nakayama would falsify death certificates for the Ishikawas. A total of 84 burial permits were delivered to Kotobuki Sanin, half of the number of children there. Some of her victims starved, others would die from neglect, but Ishikawa would actively participate in the murder of some infants and solicit money from the parents, arguing that it would cost less to bury them than it would to care for them, despite loads of incriminating evidence tying her to the most sensationalized infanticide in Asia, Ishikawa managed to be released after only serving four years in prison. What's even more surprising is that she went on to work as a realtor under the same name and from the same location as her crimes until her death in 1987. The maker of Correggio, Leonardo Chianciulli, might not be remembered for having the highest kill count, but she definitely had one of the strangest methods of disposal, turning her victims into soaps and tea cakes. Born in Avaliona in Italy, Chianciulli was highly superstitious. She claimed her mother had cursed her following her marriage and that the curse contributed to rifts in her marriage. She also frequented palmists and fortune tellers who would deliver harrowing tales of misfortune. Surprising. None of this was particularly worrisome, but when Chianciulli's oldest and favorite child, Giuseppe, was set to serve in the Italian military, she resorted to human sacrifices to keep her son from leaving. Chianciulli killed three middle-aged women from 1939 to 1940. Her MO was pretty straightforward. She lured the women under the false pretext of a job or marriage, drugged their wine, and murdered them with an axe. Your usual run-of-the-mill serial killer, right? Wrong. Chianciulli drained her victim's blood in a basin, chopped their body up into pieces, and would then wait for the blood to coagulate before mixing it in her recipe for tea cakes. She would then melt her victim's flesh with caustic soda to make soap. Chianciulli was eventually caught and confessed to all three murders. She died in 1970 at the age of 77. Eileen Wernos, Charlize Theron's portrayal of Wernos in the 2003 biopic Monster was nothing short of a masterpiece. Monster tells the story of one of America's most notorious female serial killers, Eileen Wernos. Wernos left home at the age of 15 after enduring years of abuse at the hands of her maternal grandfather. Wernos had been legally adopted by her maternal grandparents alongside her brother after her father had killed himself and her mother had abandoned them. Supporting herself and her live-in partner through sex work, Wernos claimed to have killed a total of seven men over the span of a year whom she claimed tried to sexually assault her. She would later be found guilty of six of the murders, although Wernos admitted to all seven. She did, however, retract her original plea of self-defense, claiming that only one of the men assaulted her, the others only tried to. Eileen Wernos was executed by lethal injection in 2002, following her last meal, a cup of coffee. The old lady killer. When Juana Barraza was a young girl, her mother traded her for three bottles of beer to a man who violently assaulted her. Barraza's relationship with her alcoholic mother was turbulent and traumatic, something Barraza was never able to recover from, despite becoming an acclaimed professional wrestler. Successful in her own romantic relationships and having children of her own, Barraza maintained a disdain for women who fit her mother's description. Mexico's most prolific female serial killer would then go on to murder between 40 and 48 elderly women from the 1990s until finally being apprehended in 2006. Barraza's method of killing was either asphyxiation or traumatic injury. How did Barraza manage to evade capture for so long? Despite investigators referring to the culprit as cunning and collective, Barraza was sloppy in her skills. She only managed to evade capture because investigators would explore every route besides the obvious. For example, the prime suspect was considered to be either male or a trans female owing to Barraza's build, or how investigators tried linking Jean-Baptiste Grutz's painting Boy in Red Waistcoat to an otherwise obvious case. For her crimes, Barraza was sentenced to 759 years in prison at Santa Martha Acatidla, of which she has served
served 13 years. And that concludes our video. Who do we miss? And who do you like an entire video on? Make sure you let us know by commenting down below. Thanks for watching.